I can't breathe. That's uh, the line, one of the last lines of George Floyd. We've all seen the video and that sentence, I can't breathe, has resonated, has sent shockwaves all over the world and has started a lot of these protests that's going on. But for a mom like me, him calling out for his mom, mama, mama, uh, th that's what spoke to me as a mom and that's what broke me to hear a grown man calling for his mom while dying at the neck of a white police officer. That's brutality. No one should ever die like that, no matter the crime, no matter whatever. No one should die like that. And, um, and that's what got me to thinking about being a mom and raising my children. But I, in my conversations with other people, especially Filipino moms with black children, I hear them. I hear that their outrage is greater. Their rage is deeper. Their wounds are more painful than any other mom. And it opened my eyes to how they are raising their half Filipino, half black children. And it's more difficult. I, I used to think that motherhood, the struggles, the issues are universal, but it's not. Because for a Filipino mom of black children or for moms of black children, it's different. And that's what we're gonna be talking about here on the show. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. I'm your host Janelle So, and you are watching So Janelle, where we strive to give you accurate information, culturally relevant features, and helpful tools to manage during this time. We are beset with a triple crisis. There is the pandemic, there is the protests over and, and the call for social uh, reform because of racial injustice, and there is this looming depression. It's, it's just all sad, but we're trying to give you stories that inspire and stories that lift you up, and some information as we educate ourselves in this Black Lives Matter movement. Because it's not just their fight, it is our fight as we all are calling out for social reform, but make no mistake about it, it is them that's suffering the most black communities and so we stand in solidarity we try to help as much as we can and here to give us more information about this is a friend of mine she is a digital producer for mainstream media also um, an entrepreneur who has started her own production company here is takaya king on so informed takaya king i know you're very busy and so i thank you for making time for us today Oh, no problem, Janelle. You know, I would love to be there for you anytime you call. As an African-American, could you share with us your thoughts on everything that's going on, you know, from racism, systemic injustice, comment on the protesters, comment on the death. And it's not just George Floyd. There's others who have died at the hands of the police and others who have died at the hands of um, white supremacists, those who think that they are better just because of their skin color. Well, you know, my feelings have been all over the place. As you are aware, I am a major network news producer and I have a digital media company. So I consult for a variety of startups, networks, and different corporations. And now I'm looking at the response and also in, in different ways as a person being part of society and part of the community, also as a, a, a a member of the Associated Press from a media aspect. And then I'm looking at it from my history in, in my family. How has this systemic racism and these injustices affected my own family for all of these years? And then when I watch the coverage, it makes me feel a variety of things. And that's what I hope that we can kind of go through today with your audience in efforts to educate people, because I'm sure in the Asian community, you have been feeling that as well. Exactly. So as a TV and digital content producer, what are your thoughts on the coverage of these events? In the beginning, we saw a lot of the media um, showing the violence and the aggression, which elicited a different kind of response from some members of the community. But then also um, after that, after the initial wave, we saw a lot of peaceful protests. The media started interviewing several kinds of people. And so we're getting mixed messages still but what are your thoughts on that is it the media's fault is it so should we then if we take it upon ourselves to learn and educate ourselves where do we go in regards to media it is our job and we have an ethical duty to disseminate information for the public in a way that's truthful in a way that 
catches the humanity and the community and the spirit of why are these people out here protesting, not just in America, but throughout the whole world. What has been going on in all of these 400 years and use the examples of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, of all of those that have passed on, like the Reverend Al Sharpton mentioned in today's services. It's not just the neck of George Floyd. It is the neck of all of those who we have lost. It is the neck of all Americans that have faced some sort of systematic racial oppression. And right now, we want the focus to be solely on the Black community because we are seeing it more and more done to other African Americans or Black communities, not just in white or Asian or Latino communities. And that's what we have to really take our mission seriously as media content providers. Educate people, show through storytelling that is professional and well executed. I don't expect to see reporters cowering in bushes, waiting on some next story development that is going to possibly portray or characterize the protesters, which are all racist right now, and I can't even just say black people because I'm seeing elderly people, I'm seeing young people of all demographics coming together in these protests. And I don't want them characterized in any type of negative way. We need to pivot the storytelling and educate and see how we can develop different methods so we don't have to feel like the police are not protecting the community. And that's what I think is very important to point out. Why are these people out there protesting? Uh, what kind of injustices are there? Why are these millennials getting involved? What kind of opportunities have we created for them to vent their frustration? And right now, mental health and social programming and social advocates such as yourself is what we need to get involved and be the face of this fight with us. And thank you for that. When you say the face of this fight with us, as an Asian American, I've asked this before in my community, some people are saying, Janelle, this is not our fight. This is the black community's fight. We're just standing with them. Although I've spoken to a historian, a professor, an activist last week on the show who said, although still Filipino as well, who said, no, Janelle, we fight with them. Their fight is our fight. So as a member of the African American, the black community, Takaya, what do you expect from us? Do we just stand with you or do we take this on as our fight as we are fighting the same social injustices? Racism, we've had like the last few months, we've also been talking about xenophobia. We've talked about police brutality as well. We've been victims of that as well. We've talked about hate crimes. We've been victims of that as well. So is this our fight or is this, do you want this to be just your fight and we support? Well, thank you. That is a really good question, Janelle. And I think by your viewers seeing this interview, I hope that it will really enforce that I believe it is all of our fight, but it is a plight right now where the focus has to be on the Black community. First, we're the ones that have suffered. We're the ones whose images are being portrayed by officers with their shoe on our neck as our life is drained out of our bodies not other white people, not other Asian people, and not other Latin people. So if you care about us in our world as a humanity and a community, then it should outrage anyone that has a beating heart and a pulse. It should activate within your own self, what can my essential service be? How can I help this cause in a way that feels comfortable for me and my family? What do I have in the Asian community that I can also take the plight of the black community and then apply it to what's going on within our own community that is impacting our own Asian society here? And that's what's very important. This is a way to initiate conversation and enact change. And this has to be discussed with us all. And when you talk about enacting change and reform, one of the biggest cries of the Black Lives Matter movement is defunding the police. And there seems to be confusion about that as well. When we say defunding the police, 
What are your thoughts on that? What do you mean by that? First of all, from the images and the videos that we are all now witnessing, it is quite apparent that some have used abuse of power. So the reason why there are cries to defund the police is that there has to be some level of restructuring. There has to be some level of accountability. There has to be some way that police are now focusing on serving the community as community police, as community servants. And that is what we all have to enact within our own communities to make sure happens. And whether it's defunding part of the police department, reallocating some of those services to social organizations, whether it is restructuring them, that is a question that we all have to ask ourselves right now and design what are the correct ways and methods that we can fight this. Right, because some purists are twisting this and saying, oh, now they want to abolish the police system. Now we don't have cops um, to protect us. And, and you're saying that's not the call. Well, that's not true. And if you really cite some cases in where police officers are paid well, if you were to look into a neighborhood where I produce news uh, for KPRC, in Houston, it's a suburb called Sugarland, Texas, and it is a very mixed, uh, diverse community. The police officers are paid very well there, and when they do give a ticket, oftentimes the, the, the community person is feeling bad themselves. They said, you know, by this officer being pleasant with me, it made me check my own behavior. And I started to slow down. So if we are able to enact some type of restructuring, maybe the police officers can then focus their message on directing maybe at that time that person's behavior instead of being so aggressive or instead of feeling like they need to pull a taser out or having even a gun. It is about being able to communicate respectfully, treating each other civilly as human beings. And if you're able to do that, I think a lot of the level of crime would probably dissipate. Thank you, Takaya, for making time for us today. I know it's, it's very short, um, but I know there's a lot of things that we still need to navigate, especially for Asian Americans, especially for people like me, an immigrant who comes here to America without knowledge of Black history, that's not an excuse. We have to take it upon ourselves to educate ourselves and our communities, our families. We have some biases that we may not be aware of and it just comes out in our speech. Um, if there's one thing that you want us to take away from this conversation with you, one, two, three things, what would those be? I definitely would encourage to start conversating, even if it feels uncomfortable. This is not going to be an easy fight. So we have to make sure we start by communicating within our own families, within our own friends, within our own uh, community of coworkers. That's where the conversation begins. And then branch out. Right now, I've heard from other news producers, we're seeing other people um, basically reach out from all across the world. And it's up to us to educate ourselves start the community, start disrupting, using our ability to control and spread messaging to help individuals understand. And when we are media producers, we have to take it upon ourselves to be ethical and to really evaluate what the story is in order to benefit society so the world can become a better place for us all. And thank you so much, Janelle, for inviting me. I really appreciate your time today as well. Thank you for sharing your time with us here on So Janelle. If you're just joining us earlier, we talked to Takaya King, who is a producer and also an entrepreneur producing different stories for mainstream media. If you missed any of those, please, and also tell your friends and family about us on YouTube. And we do our YouTube premieres on Wednesday nights, and that is 8 p.m. here Pacific Time, 11 p.m. Eastern Time, and also 11 a.m. Thursday morning in the Philippines. And again, if you have friends and family in Europe, Asia, the Middle East, please tell them about us because I know that they would want to know what's happening to Filipinos in America. And this afternoon on the show, I opened with um, 
talking about being a mom, talking about the struggles of moms raising black children. One of those is um, Jennifer Taylor. She is a community leader, uh, an advocate for the community, uh, a, a very um, self, -res a very respected, esteemed, and also self-made Filipina who married a black man and are now raising together as a couple. They are now raising two beautiful half Filipina, half black children. And from their experiences, we want to understand we want to understand a biracial household and here they are to share their stories with us. Jennifer and Jillian Taylor, hello and welcome to Sojanel. Thank you for making time for us. Thanks for having, Thank us. having us. I feel like talking to best friends, friends, you guys look like sisters. <laughs> One of the things that resonated from the George Floyd video was his call for his mom. And that touched a lot of moms. It touched me as well, being a mom. But in my conversations with other moms, especially Filipino moms of black children, I, I'm seeing that the rage is more, the outrage is louder, um, the wounds are deeper. Can you speak to us about that? Uh, you know, when I first saw him call for his mother, obviously it breaks every mother's heart when their child um, calls for them in pain. But I think the difference between you know everybody else and uh, that particular situation is because uh, black men and their boys hold their mother on this pedestal, and so you know there's even when you think about the things that you don't say, the the one thing that you don't say to a black man or a black boy, you don't use their mother's name. So when he called out for his mother, of course that's crushing, but for the black community. It was like, you know, calling for your mother on steroids. I've always thought that motherhood is such a universal thing. You want to protect your child. You want to keep him or her safe. You want to teach him the ways of life. But for a black, uh, for a mom of a black child, it's more. What are those things that you specifically tell your children that some of us may not even think about telling our children? There's so many different things that are different, but the one thing that does pop out at me is that most people that don't come from a background of, of uh, being people of color, you get to choose when you have the discussion about racism with your kids. When you have kids that are black, there's no choice because they feel it at a very early age. Either something is said to them, something is done to them, but the, the idea of choosing the time that you get to talk about racism you don't you don't have that luxury Jillian, you're beautiful. you're 19, yeah. 19 years old, smart girl. Um, and you're Filipino black. Um, at what age were you made aware that you are Filipino and black? I think I was about five. So in kindergarten is like when I started piecing things together because my classroom was fairly big. I think there were maybe um, 25 to 29 kids in that class. And I instantly saw that I was darker than all the other girls in my class and like that didn't really change anything because we were children and we didn't know any better so like race didn't mean anything to us like we were just kids like having fun but I did I knew by like my the color of my skin the way my hair was so Jennifer at what age did you um start talking to your children about the color of their skin maybe the hair the way they look the culture uh, even before I had um Savannah, I was already reading books on biracial parenting, and so it's something that you start at a, at a very early age. Jillian, how did you feel when your mom first talked to you about that? I think in the beginning, I didn't really understand the depth of it. I think she was just telling me the facts, but also it was, um, it was for me to experience what it's like being biracial, and then I would come to her with questions. Like her outwardly telling me like, oh, this is how it is, this is how it is. Like, I'm not going to understand till I experience it. Before all this happened, the killing of George Floyd, the protests and everything, do you recall the last time that you were reminded of this racial inequality? Um, it's very apparent in a lot of professional situations, especially like in school. Um, so like my first year being at the University of Arizona, there's not a whole lot of... Um, people of color at the school. It's a lot of, um, it's predominantly white school. So like, especially in my smaller classes, like English class, I would usually be the only black girl or the only black person or person of color in my classroom. So, and 
it's kind of like in college it's kind of like cliquish like you kind of only hang out with the people that you really resonate with so in those classes like I wouldn't really have a partner to you know do projects with or to talk to because they would turn to people that look like them so I would kind of be the only one sitting in class like not having a partner and the teacher would or a professor would come come up and say like oh where's your partner I was like well I didn't really mash up with anyone so it's it's very apparent in school and just in regular society when it's that apparent um do you voice it out um I think first I voice it to my family my friends because I think they understand the most and then if it starts getting to a level where it's interfering with my schooling with my education or if I'm trying to get somewhere and that's a roadblock, then it's definitely going to be brought up to whoever is in higher power, like a professor or a teacher or a counselor. Like, yes, I'm going to say something. I know it's difficult. As a Filipino mom as well, we're taught to be subservient, right? I was raised where I couldn't question authority. I couldn't question my parents' decision. Is that how you're raising your kids? Because that's how, as a Filipino, we're taught to raise our kids as well. No, absolutely not. I think one of the things, um, one of the things I learned, you know, being Filipino American and being uh, raised in a Westernized environment is to be assertive, and that's something that not only is that something that I, um, my husband and I teach to our kids, but it's also something that whenever I get the opportunity to to tell the the older Filipino generation is to speak up for yourself. I became a fan the moment I heard about Swirls for Girls because here you are, a Filipino mom bringing up biracial children, African-American children, and you're not stopping at just crying foul. You're not stopping at the outrage. You're not letting your emotions get a better view because in fact you're thinking and that's how you started Swirls for Girls. And we're going to be talking about that when we return on the show, Don't Go Away. Still talking to uh, Jennifer and Jillian Taylor today on the show. Uh, Jennifer is Filipina and she's married to an African American and they have a daughter, uh, two daughters actually, Savannah and Jillian um, is making time for us today on the show, sharing her thoughts on everything that's going on. And earlier before the break, I talked about Swirls for Girls. Tell us about the birth of Swirls for Girls. Uh, Swirls for Girls was started back in 2008. Um, and, and the thought behind it was, uh, I'd already been reading books that said when girls turn, when children of mixed races turn 10 years old, they'll start to realize that they don't look like the rest of their environment. And, you know, being forward thinking, I knew that there were going to be some experiences uh, that my children who are black would experience that I wouldn't even be able to relate to. And so the thought was to create this environment where girls that look like each other could come together. And it's focusing on um, self-advocacy, identity, uh, and social consciousness for girls. What I love about the story about Swirls is we created the organization to prepare and protect our children for this moment and for every moment in between because we wanted the, the girls to be able to cope with uh, the ugliness of life but also to, you know, to celebrate the great things in it. So our girls that we service are between the ages of 6 to 16 um, and then after 16, once they're 17, they become mentors. Um, so, so we have monthly meetings. Uh, we do cultural outings. We focus on higher education. We try to break up, uh, ex try to break up the experience for the young girl, girl so it's relevant for them. Jillian, how has Swirls for Girls helped in you growing up, in your self-identification, in having a safe space, safe community around you? It made a space of support, love, and understanding within myself and with the girls. And we've all really bonded together so closely that we're all sisters now. And it did make me aware of like, the things that were gonna happen when I got older that I learned as a child. Like how I might be treated differently in, um, pro in a professional setting, like in terms of getting a job and being, and like being ignored over like a group of like, let's say white men that are applying for a job. Like I'll probably, be overlooked yeah I think it really just made me understand like what type of girl I am like um, in terms of ethnicity but also like in terms of like like my personal values like it made me learn a lot um, I overheard a mom say that she's raising her children to be more aware of their blackness over their Filipino-ness because it's 
it's easier to navigate being Filipino than being Black in America. Your thoughts on that? Everybody, everybody parents differently. And the way that I, you know, my family and I, uh, my husband and I decided to raise our kids is to celebrate their race, their ethnicity, their nationality, and their culture. We're doing our children a disservice if you're not um, providing them pride of, of who they are in whole, um, which then it turns into self-confidence, right? Right. Your thoughts on that, um, Jillian? Do you identify more with being Filipino or being Black? Um, in like a regular day-to-day -day life, I think it's pretty equal. But then when certain situations such as the current state of the world right now, um, I think my Blackness comes out a little bit more because I understand and I know what I really know what's going on because I've experienced it. And now that you've graduated from Swirls, you're now a mentor. What do you tell your mentee or mentees? So to the younger girls, I just tell them to learn and educate themselves as much as they can about themselves, their family, their culture, and also society because that all kind of comes, that all comes together like when you get older, when you find your place in the world. I love that. Um, what about you, Jennifer? For people that are watching, especially Filipino immigrants who may still have biases, our parents, you know, your parents, uh, what would you tell them? Everybody should really look at life with their own set of lenses. And then beyond that, continue to tell your kids that, you know, they're black, they're beautiful, they're strong, because as you're seeing what's happening in this world is um, more often than not, most people are telling them that, you know, they're less than, um, the color of their skin discounts them. So, you know, as a parent, be, be kind to your kids, um, but also remember that when they grow up, that inner voice that speaks to them is the sound of those mother's voice. I love that. When kids grow up, the inner voice that will speak to them is the sound of their mother's voice. Um, you seem to have done a great job parenting your two daughters. Uh, Jillian, I didn't I didn't write about this as I didn't want you guys to prepare. If you had a message for your mom, what would it be? Um, I would say thank you for doing so many things and creating so many things that helped me find myself and helped me understand the world, understand others, because that's really done so much for me. That's opened up so many doors and also has exposed me to I would say just understanding of all the little aspects of life and about myself. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, you guys can hug. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I like I like Jennifer because she's not letting her emotions get the better of her. I've seen your Facebook posts as well, Jennifer. They're very eye-opening. And even when people try to disagree with your views, you're still very respectful. And I think those are the gems that your children, your daughters are gonna pick up from you. Now your message for Jillian and for Savannah, who can't join us, but hopefully she'll watch this. You know, I've been, um, it's, a, it's a message that I, I tell them often, which is they are enough that it doesn't matter what other people think of them. It doesn't even matter what my husband and I think of them. It, all that matters is what you think of yourself. So go, you know, going out into the world, just know that things are going to be thrown at you and things are going to be said, but always hold in your heart that you know who you are and that you Thank you so much. Beautiful girls, beautiful message. This is probably one of my favorite interviews. I, I, I'm learning a lot, Jennifer, and I'm so happy that we're friends. Continue, the, continue your good work, and I, hopefully this is not the last that we'll have you on the show. More power. That. And Jillian, good luck on your journey. You, you're in good hands. You have an amazing mom, amazing support around you. Thank you so much. God bless to both of you. Nothing is more beautiful, I think, than the love of a mother for her child. And that is why I keep saying this, I applaud Jennifer. She didn't let her fear get the better of her. She didn't uh, show rage or outrage or bitterness. What she's doing is she actually, aside from just talking, she's actually made something. Uh, she's actually started a nonprofit organization to help her children and now in a way helping 
biracial children, providing them with a safe and inclusive space where they can learn about cultures and where they can learn about identities. Information on the screen if you want to maybe sign up your children. I know I'm just waiting for Lily. She's four now. When she turns six, I'm going to sign her up for Swirls for Girls. But once again, thank you for joining us on the show. I hope you found information today, helpful tools, as well as inspiration from the story of Jennifer and her daughter, Jillian. And again, if you want to catch more, catch us on YouTube, www.youtube.com slash Sojanelle, where we also do, don't forget, our YouTube premieres every Wednesday night, 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. Eastern, and 8 a.m. Thursday morning in Manila. And please tell your friends and uh, family all over the world you can now catch us on YouTube. For now, also keep our weekly dates here on TV. Next week, same time, same channel. I'm your host Janelle So and this has been So Janelle.